Okay, great. Thanks, Dr. Leaf. It's nice uh, timing when it works out that way that a professor will come and give a redo and a much better job than I'm about to do today. <laughs> so this will be the, the primer level and then we'll get the real talk from the real expert uh, later. But I thought I'd review today Hereditary RCC. It hasn't been done on the Ground Rounds website for, for a little while and uh, it's an interesting topic with a lot of clinical and, and basic science implications. So the objectives today are just to very briefly review the differences between sporadic and hereditary RCC as distinct <coughs> phenotypes with potential common underlying genetics. Describe the common uh, subtypes, and here uh, it's easy to get lost in all these new subtypes that are being described nowadays, so there's a specific focus on those that are driven by VHL, MET, and fumarate hydratase. And uh, in combination with describing these subtypes, I'd like to go just a little bit into the underlying genetics and just show how uh, understanding the familial genetics of RCC can inform uh, disease-based treatment for even sporadic diseases which are resulting from the same type of mutations. And then finally ending with a little clinical talk on the screening management and follow-up guidelines for HRCC um, in which there is uh, new, new uh, papers being published by the Canadian Kidney Cancer Group. So the first is just the brief differences between sporadic and hereditary RCC. So, uh, you know, it's, it's clear now that the, the term kidney cancer is falling out of favor to describe uh, the cancer or the neoplasm based on the subtype or cell of origin. But even RCC itself is uh, sporadic and uh, can be a her um, heterogeneous uh, group of diseases from all the different epithelial cells that form the, the renal tubule. And we know that from collecting duct carcinoma, medullary carcinoma, uh, clear cell uh, and uh, chromophobe originating from different areas on the nephron. And so they each have a different uh, clinical behavior and again different underlying genetics which are important to understand and so to not clump these all as just uh, RCC or even hereditary RCC. The classic description or when to be concerned clinically about a hereditary RCC is in patients that ha are, are young or present with bilateral multifocal uh, renal tumors or those that have extra renal features which we'll get into and collectively these hereditary forms of RCC account for roughly three to eight percent depending on the series of uh, total RCC so not the rarest not the most common and something I'm sure people in practice uh, over a career in urology will certainly see a, a couple of so uh, the hereditary subtypes can be grouped in many different ways by syndrome or by histology and this list is constantly changing. Uh, it was actually longer and I decided to take some out just for, for clarity but there's constantly being new and new subtypes that are being defined uh, and we're finding more and more driver mutations that are leading to different types of hereditary RCCs. So the ones that we're most familiar with I'm sure myself at least are is VHL uh, and leading to a clear cell phenotype. Uh, hereditary papillary RCC leading to a type 1 phenotype, the hereditary leiomyomatosis RCC leading to an aggressive type 2 phenotype, and good old Berthog Dubé uh, leading to a chromophobe uh, uh, phenotype. Uh, for examinship and exam fodder, all of these are autosomal dominant, almost all of these, and that's a, a classic question that I think has come up on some of our exams. So uh, just again a brief look at sporadic versus hereditary. Sporadic is often incidental, discovered in the elderly, that classic small renal mass incidentaloma. Hereditary RCCs tend to present in younger uh, patients with that predisposition to be multifocal and bilateral. In sporadic RCC, you know, 65-year-old uh, uh, person with an incidental 3-centimeter mass, there's no need for workup of family members, whereas if you have younger patients, certainly a detailed family history, family history of any extra renal symptoms that would prompt you to consider a hereditary syndrome uh, is important, and this provides an opportunity for disease screening and early detection. Again, extra renal manifestations, sporadic RCC shouldn't have any, and hereditary RCC is associated with uh, a certain list of them specific to the, the, the underlying genetic disease. Uh, the TCGA has shed a lot of light on sporadic RCC and the underlying mutations that drive uh, the, the sporadic types, and there's a lot of similarities between this and the underlying genetics of hereditary RCC, and that's what I'd like to touch on a little bit uh, in this talk. And in sporadic RCC, the background kidney is oftentimes normal, uh, whereas in hereditary RCC, there's a lot of descriptions, which are, a lot of them are quite old, but they describe a lot of background, either, either cystic changes disease or microscopic neoplasia, with uh, some reports saying in VHL, the background kidney can have up to 1,200 microscopic foci of, of disease. Um, in papillary, they've described hundreds, and in Berthog-Dubé, there's been a description of dozens of background uh, uh, tumors. <coughs> 
So just comparing some of the hereditary genes to the sporadic genes that can uh, lead to the different subtypes of, uh, of RCC, uh, VHL, MET, fumarate hydratase, <coughs> and Berthog dubé uh, Berthog dubé we now know is, is uh, the hereditary gene is, is folliculin. It's not called BHD. Uh, but there's a lot of homology, especially in clear cell, sorry, especially in clear cell RCC where VHL seems to be sporadically mutated in almost 90% of, of the tumors, either a distinct mutation in VHL or some anomaly of chromosome 3 where VHL is found. And similar uh, findings for MET, uh, in this uh, figure, it describes only 13% uh, sporadic mutations of MET, but once again, when you include chromosome 7, uh, large uh, uh, translocations or trisomy of chromosome 7, then I think that number increases to almost 80% of sporadic uh, type 1 papillary RCCs with some type of uh, aberration of MET. The implications of these RCC syndromes and hereditary RCCs are far-reaching because, first of all, clinically for patients, it provides an opportunity to identify the predisposing gene and offer genetic screening for other family members, which leads to earlier testing and potentially earlier intervention with the goal of preventing metastasis and obviously uh, uh, preventing and nephron-sparing approaches to uh, prevent uh, end-stage renal disease and the need for dialysis. It sheds light on active surveillance, and uh, when Dr. Linehan comes, I'm sure there'll be a lot of talk about that, as I think that their team pioneered that the whole idea of waiting until three centimeters before intervening for hereditary uh, RCCs. Mike it was Mike Jewett for hereditary RCCs as well. Well, um, you talk hereditary concept. Yeah, yeah, certainly. Uh, but yeah, so the, it certainly provides the opportunity to apply these to the sporadic RCC population as well. And then finally, understanding those genotype phenotype implications leads to uh, increased understanding of what drives disease and what potential targets there may be. So now I'd like to just go into some of the subtypes, starting with clear, uh, VHL and clear cell RCC, and highlight the, the hereditary disease and some of the underlying genetics and the similarities between the sporadic and uh, familial subtypes. So von Hippel-Lindau disease, autosomal dominant, like all of them, is probably the most well-known and well-described of the RCC syndromes, and is due to the abnormal VHL protein, which is found on chromosome 3P. And there's a lot of aberrations of chromosome 3P and clear cell RCC and VHL and other genes at, at that locus may be involved uh, in the, the pathogenesis and driving uh, the phenotype of RCC. There's the clear set of extra renal symptoms, uh, uh, syndromes, or sorry, uh, manifestations associated with VHL. And uh, we'll touch on these later, but this is the classic list uh, that we all should know. And there are clear genotype-phenotype associations in RCC, which is to say that certain uh, mutations result in different penetrance or different aggressivity of, of disease. So patients have a germline mutation in the VHL gene and then take another hit. Uh, and lose their, have a loss of heterozygosity, which results in the, the manifestation of clinical VHL, which includes the bilateral, multifocal, and early onset clear cell RCC. The, the other extra renal symptoms are, are well described and actually occur in different subsets of VHL, uh, which, which uh, we'll touch on in a moment. Uh, there's a lot of review papers and a lot of good work on, on uh, understanding the function of VHL and its description and the types of mutations that arise in the familial forms. But the key the uh, findings, just to highlight, are that uh, in the mid-90s, that segment of chromosome 3 and mutations in VHL were found to be altered in most cases of sporadic RCC. It was already known to be associated with familial. And that uh, a lot of the downstream effects from abnormal uh, VHL signaling results in increased HIF2, which it appears to be a major driver of clear cell RCC. And then following TCGA's detailed description of the genetics of clear cell RCC, we have a lot more uh, uh, understanding of what drives it. And it seems that RCC is a metabolic disease and also a disease of abnormal DNA um, uh, methylation, which results in a whole host of abnormal gene expression, which drives the, the phenotype. But the key uh, line, one line from this, is that the loss of VHL leads to HIF-alpha activation and all the downstream effects of, of HIF-alpha. So talking about those genotype-phenotype correlations again, VHL is uh, substratified into type 1 and type 2. Uh, type uh, 2 essentially is the type that manifests with pheochromocytoma, and type 1 uh, uh, patients tend not to have that. But it's interesting when you look at the types of mutations these patients have, um, 
the type 1s are characterized by major uh, events in the VHL gene, either leading to a nonsense mutation or a total deletion of the protein. And so HIF expression is really uh, unopposed and, and quite high. And these patients present with the class with the type 1, which is associated with uh, most of the hemangioblastomas in the retinum and the brain stem and spinal cord and clear cell RCC, but interestingly not uh, pheochromocytoma, whereas the type 2, which are associated with more mild, one could say, mutations of the VHL protein, where it's a missense mutation, one amino acid for another, they tend to be characterized by pheochromocytoma, but later onset of uh, RCC. And uh, going into the a little bit more detail on that these pathways it's extremely complex and I think as you know we, we learn a lot as urologists about the AR signaling pathway in prostate cancer and I think these pathways are coming out as major drivers of, of clear cell RCC as well uh, and so the, the gist of it essentially is that HIF alpha needs to be degraded by the VHL complex and so anything that disrupts the VHL complex ability to identify HIF1 alpha can lead to abundant HIF1 alpha signaling and all its downstream effects which are the drivers of clear cell RCC. Um, this is obviously a very simplified uh, figure and it can be made a lot more complex but it's just to show that mutation See if I can move the mouse without it changing slides on me. No. This mouse. No. Uh, it just shows that the, the mutations can occur anywhere along these proteins that are involved. So either in these PhDs, which are prolyl hydroxylase enzymes, if they're not able to hydroxylate HIF1-alpha, HIF1-alpha can then go along, bind to its heterodimer, HIF1-beta, and drive its downstream mutation. If the VHL is not competent, then again, that HIF1-alpha can, can drive its downstream uh, uh, targets. And finally, VHL itself uh, is stabilized by a lot of accessory and, and co-chaperone uh, proteins and mutations in those can also lead to a clear cell phenotype. So there's a lot of potential different targets, uh, different genes that can result in the, the phenotype of clear cell uh, renal cell carcinoma. So this uh, VHL protein structure, and this is a lot of work done by uh, Marsden and Linehan in fact, um, it has been well characterized as having two large complexes, the alpha and beta uh, domains. And it showed that the, the, um, the alpha domain is what's responsible for binding all these accessory proteins, particularly along in B and C. And binding uh, uh, to this complex stabilizes VHL, which allows it to remain active and seek out these uh, HIF alphas for degradation. So you, it just highlights, again, all these levels of mutations that can occur to result in uh, abnormal signaling and unopposed HIF-1 uh, activity. It's the beta domain of the VHL that actually binds the hydroxylated HIF and mutations in the beta domain as well can result in different phenotypes of clear cell RCC. So once again, coming back to, to this figure here, we know that the, the VHL protein binds hydroxylated HIF-1 alpha and therefore loss of the high, of, uh, VHL protein leads to HIF-1 activation. And this here just shows that uh, the mutations, the most common sites of the mutations is the VHL gene, as we know, and these prolyl hydroxylases, which are getting a lot of attention. And I didn't focus on them subsequently, but there's a lot of interest in these uh, uh, proteins as an uh, approach to target cancer meta metabolics, because uh, they're really oxygen-sensing enzymes and cell energy-sensing enzymes. But I'll leave that to Dr. Linehan, I guess. Uh, so what are those genes that are driven by HIF alpha? So the classic one we all know because it's being targeted by the current therapies for clear cell RCC is angiogenesis driven through VEGF, PDGF, and CKIT. And these are targetable proteins and we have newer agents constantly being described to target these. Uh, glucose uptake and metabolism is also a key regulator of HIF alpha and that's why a lot of the current description of RCC is really describing it as a metabolic uh, disease primarily and then secondarily we'll see as a disease of, of abnormal DNA methylation, so an epigenetic disease as well. It's obviously again more complex than this as well because VHL has also been shown to have a lot HIF independent activities. Uh, and so you see on this figure here, we're targeting that second thing on the left, uh, angiogenesis, downstream of HIF-alpha. Uh, but VHL is very well described as having so many effects that are beyond HIF-alpha. And so there's a lot of potential new targets that are being identified. And uh, when you go onto the VHL Family Alliance website, for example, they, they fund a lot of projects related specifically to, to targeting these and identifying these new pathways to lead to new therapies for VHL.
specifically the genotype phenotype correlations here because when when patients are referred for genetic testing and the report comes back describing either a frame shift mutation in VHL or a deletion in VHL, it does have different clinical consequences to the patient uh, based on the, the age that they would tend to get disease and also the, the, the phenotype either being with type 1 or type 2. So uh, the, the take home from here is patients that have these frame shift and nonsense mutations, which is just a non-functional truncated bit of protein that can't do any competent signaling at all, tend to have an earlier onset of disease, which makes sense uh, genetically. But this is something that can actually be relayed to the patient and can be ordered as per, uh, specific genetic testing. This is one of the, the nicer figures, just highlighting again the VHL proteins and the classic sites of the mutations that we see. And most of the mutations are actually in the elongin binding domain. So the actual VHL protein can bind HIF fine, but because it cannot bind elongin, it can't stay around in the cytosol enough and just gets degraded too quickly. And the most common mutations are in this, this alpha area. The second most common area is actually the, that HIF binding pocket. Uh, so we need to move the mouse for sphere of the slides moving. The second binding pocket right here, uh, and that's the, the second most common area of mutations in this protein. Uh, the TCGA has characterized clear cell renal cell carcinoma, <laughs> a sporadic form, uh, again, which has informed a lot of the underlying genetics and led to a lot of interest in new new treatments. But just to highlight here that once again, VHL is seen as as lost or downregulated or mutated in uh, a, a large number of of the uh, of these tumors of these sporadic tumors over 380 were sampled in this study but interestingly a lot of the aberrations tend to be in the locus of VHL that 3p21 to 25 where there's a lot of other genes that are being identified as uh, potential drivers of the clear cell phenotype so it's something to do with this area of the protein uh, this area of the genome in addition to where VHL is found, that can lead to different uh, degrees of VHL, different phenotypes. And once again, on the bottom uh, heat map, the first line, the most common loss in all these tumors is uh, a loss of 3P21, again, where these key genes are being discovered. In addition to this, there's obviously a lot of additional mutations because this is sporadic RCC. And the, the conclusion from the TCGA paper is that remodeling of cellular metabolism is a recurrent pattern in clear cell RCC. And this has led to a lot of interest, again, in targeting these different metabolic pathways uh, for this disease. There's a patient uh, support group and a v Canadian VHL alliance. And again, this is actually a pretty large funding agency. And if you go there and you see their newsletters, it's all just new papers on targeting VHL, targeting HIF-1, targeting these prolyl hydroxylases. Um, and they, they have a lot of their own guidelines that they publish in terms of patient screening, which we'll uh, touch on uh, shortly. So uh, that's it for VHL. The next one is type 1 papillary RCC, which is characterized by a mutation in MET. Once again, autosomal dominant, to hit that home. So this familial RCC is caused by activating mutations of the MET gene, which is found on chromosome 7. Uh, it tends not to have extra renal manifestations, although that's kind of debated in, in the literature, but the classic teaching is it does not. And there's variable penetrance of, of these uh, tumors. Uh, it's generally described that by age 60, the majority of patients will manifest at least a tumor. That's not to say they require treatment, because as we mentioned at the beginning, a lot of these are watched to a, a threshold size, especially in type 1, which seem to be the most indolent of the, the familial types. Uh, the original paper that described the activating mutation in, in CMET was published in 1997, and they highlight uh, several cases of sporadic type 1 papillary RCC and uh, familial type 1. Obviously, the familial type occurred earlier, but the location of the mutations are all quite similar in the exon 17, 18, 19, which reflects that tyrosine kinase domain. And all of these mutations uh, result in a uh, always turned on um, MET protein, uh, where it does not need to have any binding partners for the intracellular domain of MET to constantly signal downstream. Uh, this was a, an early paper, yeah, 1998, but it just highlights one of these key uh, families, which happens to be a Canadian family that's uh, afflicted, afflicted with this uh, uh, condition. And you can see just how penetrant it can be in this uh, family, which has a specific mutation, which is, uh, you know, uh, again, in the tyrosine kinase domain. And it has very high penetrance in this family, 
uh, with many, many individuals affected. And so amongst these families that are collected at the NIH, I think two or three uh, were described as being of from a Canadian uh, origin, French Canadian uh, specifically in terms of the genetics. Once again, looking at those genotype-phenotype uh, correlations, these codons are, are relatively close to each other, all in this the tyrosine kinase domain, but they do result in different uh, clinical behavior of the disease, uh, again, characterized by earlier age of onset. And some, some of the, one of the mutations with the highest penetrance and re that requires the most treatment is this 3906 G to C uh, uh, genetic mutation at the DNA level, which results in one amino acid switched, which results in that always a, a, a turned on status of the tyrosine kinase domain. But interestingly, all of these tumors, like we see in the sporadic form, tend to be associated with a trisomy of chromosome 7. So it's, again, something pro uh, an issue with the individual gene on the chromosome and then a copy number alteration or some large chromosomal uh, abnormality of the, the chromosome itself. Does trisomy chromosome 7 give you anything else? Any other extra manifestations there? Uh, that's a good question. I think for the papillary description, there's not. And I removed a figure, but from this one, Oh, no, I see star still here. From this one here, this is what they were describing as th whether there were extra renal manifestations or not, because in this particular Canadian family, they did see that there was a higher number, although it's still rare, as you can see, of adenocarcinomas, pancreatic carcinomas, breast carcinoma. But whether that's just this one family's genetic predisposition to cancer versus due to uh, trisomy of chromosome 7 is, is, un is unclear, or due to the specific mutation, it's, it's unclear. But classically, they say, no, there's no extra renal manifestations. Again, map like the VHL gene, looking at the MET gene, very large protein with an extracellular signaling domain and then an intracellular, uh, intracellular signaling domain, which is where the tyrosine kinase domain is located with all these very well-described uh, <laughs> mutations within it. And recently, I think last year, uh, the TCGA Cancer Genome Atlas also published their comprehensive characterization of papillary RCC. And so we'll go over this twice, once for type 1 and once for type 2. But of the 75 type 1 tumors, they found that there was altered MET status, either by a distinct mutation in the gene or by some type of fusion or copy number variation of the chromosome in 81% of type 1. And again, it sheds, uh, they, the, they comment that it sheds light on the familial type informing the sporadic type in terms of our understanding of disease and where to best target the tyrosine kinase domain. And just looking at the left side, the type 1s, the, the chromosome 7 gains are, are very obvious. The MET gene mutations are fewer. Uh, I think that one is 13 to 15 percent, but the actual chromosome 7 gains, which would also result in increased MET activity, is almost ubiquitous in type 1. Uh, and so then the next one uh, is to talk about type 2 papillary RCC, and this is the one uh, ag aggressive disease characterized by a mutation in, in fumarate hydratase. Again, autosomal dominant. So it's a deficiency of fumarate hydratase, which is uh, often very well mutated, and this is one of the uh, conditions where the tumor is very aggressive and we do have very good screening. Uh, there's very well documented mutations which can very easily be identified in, in patients that are thought to be at risk for this disease. And this particular uh, gene is a Krebs cycle enzyme found on chromosome 1. And so once again, we'll have a lot of effects on the cell metabolism. Uh, there's some extra renal symptoms classically described as the young lady with, uh, with uterine leiomyomas or any male or female with these cutaneous leiomyomas, which are apparently extremely painful. And so they're, they're brought to clinical light uh, relatively early because it's not some indolent skin lesion that patients don't notice. Uh, apparently they are quite uh, tender. And this disease, again, has a high metastatic potential even at very low sizes. Uh, one of the pedigree of a, a patient uh, of a family with um, with uh, this condition, just showing the early age of death. So these are patients that died of RCC, and the the ages are really low uh, here, age 26, age 33. And so this particular family had a, had a mutation that's known to have a highly penetrant and highly aggressive form of of the disease. <coughs> 
the, the type 2 papillary RCC is one of the, the most well described as being uh, this, having this metabolic shift, uh, termed the Warburg effect in cancer. And uh, it's a very <coughs> classic description almost 100 years ago now, noted by Otto Warburg, which may be a German, I'm not, not sure. Uh, I'm looking back there, this is the German fellows, if they know. Uh, but essentially, the, the cancer cells, it's well described that these cancer cells preferentially use glycolysis as their source of ATP instead of the normal uh, Krebs cycle and then electron transports uh, chain in the mitochondrion. Uh, and this is in the setting of normal uh, oxygen levels. Uh, and even in tumor hypoxia, this is driven even more. Um, and so it's well described that these you know, tumors that are deficient in fumarate hydratase undergo this distinct metabolic shift to aerobic glycolysis. And uh, again, the suggestion is that this opens up a lot of opportunities to target the metabolic basis of disease. It's a very uh, complex signaling uh, pathway maps, but uh, this is one of the simpler ones I found. But just to, to highlight again, try to move the mouse without changing the slide here. Just to highlight that th this FH gene in the Krebs cycle is uh, inactivated, and that results in a buildup of fumarate and the inability to complete the Krebs cycle and all of its the normal way of, of de generating ATP. And so the cell, by consequence, uses a uh, uh, breakdown of glucose directly through a pentose phosphate pathway, and uh, um, essentially getting all the ATP it needs directly from glucose without all this uh, electron transport chain. But in doing so, it induces several shifts in the cell. The first is that the increased level of fumarate drives, just like in the clear cell phenotype, inhibits the proteins that are required to the appropriate handling of HIF-1. So type 2 papillary RCC is very well described, like clear cell, of having a HIF-1 activity driving its downstream targets. And on top of that, the, the large metabolic shifts associated with the inability to complete the normal energy cycle results in a lot of fatty acid synthesis and a lot of, uh, of um, free radicals and, and uh, free radicals from this, which itself can worsen disease and increase mutations elsewhere in the genome. But one highlight here is that these cells are so uh, avid for glucose, as we know, like clear cell from PET CT scans where they just light up like bulbs because they're just in, they're taking all this uh, glucose. Uh, to supply themselves with the ATP, they result in very low levels of AMP kinase, which is an energy sensing protein in the cell. And so when ATP is very high in the cell, like these cells, uh, AMPK is very low. And once again, the metabolic shift induced by this is to transfer energy towards fatty acid synthesis, which is identified as a key target uh, for type 2 papillary RCC. And also now in type 1, it's been described as well. And just to highlight directly from that long that uh, pathway, there's clinical trials coming out now looking at uh, hitting these tyrosine, these um, VEGF inhibitors, in this case ventetinib, which is one that's been used in thyroid CA, and combining it with metformin, which reverses that Warburg effect of cancer in, in a lot of preclinical models because it inhibits AMP kinase. And so there, uh, there's a lot of clinical trials coming out now looking at the combination of metformin or other uh, drugs that alter cell metabolism and the handling of, of glucose in combination with these pathways that have previously been identified looking for synergy uh, in here. And so there's a lot of these available for review on the, on the clinicaltrials.gov website. Coming back to this uh, characterization of clear of uh, papillary, which is done by the TCGA, and here they looked at 60 type 2 and 26 unclassified, of which some of them may or may not have been type 2. But the type 2s, they actually found that there's three distinct subgroups that have different genetics and different clinical behavior. And so this might be something moving forward, which is a, a, a change in, in the taxonomy of, of type 2 papillary RCC. The most common mutations were in a pathway, the NRF2 ARE pathway, which I don't know well at all. But apparently, the pathway involved in oxidative damage protection. And of the type 2s, the worst, the patients that had the worst prognosis, early death, and we'll see it on, on KM curves on the next slide, were a group that were characterized by the, what's called the CPG island methylator phenotype. Again, don't ask me too much what, what that is, but it alters the methylation across the genome, which leads to a lot of downstream effects in aberrant gene expression. And these patients had the worst prognosis, earliest death, um, and a high rate of metastatic disease. 
and they noticed in these nine, it's a low number, these nine tumors in the TCGA, these were associated with the largest Warburg effect, or that, sh that shift of cell metabolism, and they were also characterized by low fumarate hydratase. So once again, that same cycle that's, so that we know is mutated in the hereditary form of type 2 papillary RCC, and of those nine, five of them, and the paper actually doesn't give more information on this, they just say five had distinct mutations in fumarate hydratase, which were both germline and somatic. So it's unclear how many of these actually had a real, uh, the hereditary type 2 papillary RCC, but at least five had clear mutations in fumarate hydratase, which is what we see in the familial type. So the Kaplan-Meier curves for all the, the type 2s just shows the, so this actually has a type 1 on it as well. This is the C1 line. The C2B line is the type 2 and the unclassifieds, which they combined with each other. And then that type C2C is that CIMP subgroup of nine uh, patients that were essentially had the same genetics as the hereditary leiomyomatosis type RCC uh, with the, the worst overall survival and the same classic genetic changes that we know are altered in the familial form. So just comparing these again, the CIMP versus the other type 2s, clear shift uh, upregulation of the glucose handling proteins and the, the enzymes required for glycolysis and that Warburg effect of cancer, and a distinct downregulation of those genes that are involved in the Krebs cycle. So these cells are clearly mimicking this effect that we see in the familial form uh, and which has been long described as a method of cancer metabolism, but again highlights the, the possibility of targeting this as a, uh, as a therapeutic avenue for uh, papillary type 2 and likely clear cell carcinoma as well. And just to highlight where fumarate hydratase lies here, it's one of the most downregulated genes um, in these type, type 2s. Again, there's a family alliance for hereditary leiomyomatosis and renal cell carcinoma, although this website is really odd, and the most recent patient newsletter is from 2012, so I don't know, take that for what it's worth. And then fi finally, one slide on this, Bertog Dubay. Uh, I don't want to talk uh, too, too much about this one, um, but it's also well characterized as a uh, cause of hereditary chromophobe RCC caused by distinct mutations in the folliculin gene, which is on chromosome 17. It tends to be slower growing and is uh, rarely metastatic, and its extra renal symptoms are also good exam fodder and should be memorized by all of us, fibrofollicolomas, lung, lung cysts, and spontaneous uh, pneumothorax. Autosomal dominant as well. Uh, I, I just wanted to put this on here just to show again that there's a lot of commonalities in the underlying signaling pathways. Once again, it's been shown that like VHL, the folliculin might have an inhibitory effect on HIF1, and so mutations in folliculin allow HIF1 to continue to drive downstream <coughs> disease. Uh, but that's all I'll say about that one. <coughs> And it also has its own foundation for patients. And this website was actually one of the nicest one for patients to go to, I thought, um, and was, was very welcoming and had a good outline of what the disease is and, and what life is like with Bertog Dubay, which isn't so bad, it seems. Uh, uh, and then there's, um, the, and then finally, I'd just like to talk about the management and follow-up guidelines for hereditary RCC. And the, the Canadian uh, Kidney Cancer Group has highlighted on this uh, as well. So first, uh, these, these were a lot of the papers from the mid-90s, late-90s, and um, it's, it's the uh, description of renal transplantation in patients with VHL disease, where nephron-sparing approaches were very difficult to do or really not feasible, and therefore patients uh, really went on to bilateral nephrectomies and end-stage renal disease. Uh, the ASTS, the American Society of Transplant Surgeons, has guidelines on this as well, stating that after bilateral nephrectomies for hereditary RCCs, patients must wait two years before they're eligible for a transplant. And again, just here, uh, almost 20 years ago, the mean time on dialysis was exactly that, two years. But obviously, this isn't the ideal approach for these patients, especially in the era of nephron sparing. So the uh, anephric status is now extremely rare in hereditary RCC syndromes. And this is just showing the, the, the renal survival over time based on eras of, of management. And the most recent era, 2004 to 2009, you can see over the course of a patient's lifetime, they're able to, to stay with their own native kidneys, maybe having two or three or four renal How ablative. How much of that is stage migration, you know, mean time bias, and uh, detecting them so much earlier, and uh, I guess that allows partial nephrectomy. Yeah. Part 
I say that that's very true, but uh, the only thing, in the, the only caveat is that in the hereditary population, these patients have been screened for RCC with ultrasound at least even back into the 90s. So less of a, an effect of uh, stage migration in the hereditary forms versus sporadic forms, but definitely a consideration. And then obviously all the technologic advances as well of, of nephron sparing approaches and the opportunity to do a percutaneous ablation, which was a, a large milestone in, uh, in the treatment of these patients. So the, one of the earlier uh, guidelines that were published by the Canadian Kin um, Kidney Cancer Research Network, uh, a lot of this is based on expert consensus. Uh, there's not too much evidence on this, unfortunately. Uh, and Dr. So hopefully can shed some light uh, on this for us because there's another paper we'll come across in a few moments. But the evidence really is that the median age, and this is mostly from von Hippel-Lindau, but the median age of hereditary RCC is around 37 years. And so the recommendation is to, to screen patients uh, below uh, 45 years, or to be concerned of uh, kidney cancer for patients that have a renal tumor at the age of 45 years, where you'll catch roughly 75% of these patients. Um, we know that having a family history of RCC, any type, is a relative risk factor for RCC, and therefore any family history in a first or second degree uh, relative uh, can prompt a genetic screening. Other than that, the, the remainder of these recommendations, which stand to reason, multifocal bilateral okay. disease and extra renal symptoms are all driven by ex expert uh, consensus and common sense. The, this is one of the, the early papers from the Dr. Linehan's group at NCI uh, in Maryland, I believe. And this is where they suggested this approach for treating hereditary RCCs by intervening only when the largest lesion on the kidney was measuring three centimeters. And in this approach, uh, they had um, uh, 44 of their 52 patient cohort that actually reached this threshold size requiring some treatment, and the remainder of the patients could just be observed. Uh, and in their follow-up in this paper of 60 months, they saw no metastasis, and there's no need for, for dialysis in any of these patients. So they suggested that waiting till the largest tumor is 3 centimeters and then intervening and taking as many tumors as can be seen on visually and, and ultrasound is an ideal approach for these patients that are going to have recurrent uh, tumors, possibly. Again, from, from Linehan's, the management of these papers, they, we have to redefine oncologic success here as patients that are free of metastasis and free of the need for repeat interventions, regardless of what imaging is showing in the kidney. Uh, and it's very difficult to, to differentiate even a true recurrence in an ipsilateral kidney versus a new multifocal lesion because of the underlying genetics. Um, but the and so, so there's a lot of nuance here, but the breakdowns essentially is that most of the familial types, you wait till the, the mass is, the largest lesion is three centimeters, at which point it can be treated. Uh, and that's not true in the case of the hereditary leiomyomatosis RCC, which we know is very aggressive. And in, in this um, case, nephron sparing surgery is performed immediately when a tumor is found. So for example, if there's a biopsy on a 1.5 centimeter mass, they would recommend treating it right away if the biopsy confirmed a type 2 papillary RCC. Maximal renal preservation is the, the name of the game. And uh, Dr. Linehan's group, just like Dr. Jewett's group for the Canadian Active Surveillance Series for Small Renal Mass, really hammer on biopsy and the, the diagnostic information biopsy provides um, is, is pivotal and nephron sparing surgery is always pursued uh, with a combination of all the modalities we have today and there's a lot of new papers coming out on the utility of robotics in repeat and redo partials uh, which has really opened up the ability of, of really maximizing nephron sparing surgery and we'll, we'll chat about that but the the all these papers comment that repeat partial, even doing one more time, is very difficult due to fibrosis, loss of anatomic planes. And I think the, the Linehan group also advocates a retroperitoneal approach for MIS partial nephrectomies in order to, um, to avoid uh, uh, the scarring from going laparoscopically intraperitoneal. That's what the time is. I don't have a clock. OK, perfect. So there's a lot of papers describing the feasibility of doing repeat partials, and this new term has come out of salvage partial nephrectomy, which is when you're doing a third or fourth partial on the same renal unit. In this series, which is predominantly characterized by repeat offenders with VHL, they had a 20% major complication rate, which was defined as, uh, again, the clavian 3 or greater, major urine leak, transfusion, etc. 
two of these patients ended up requiring <coughs> dialysis despite having a renal remnant, likely lost due to hyperfiltration injury when a, a critical a tiny little size is left. And they even had three patients with METs in this series that were treated successfully with metastatectomy and are alive with no evidence of disease at time of publication. So this would be a classic imaging finding. We would see a patient with VHL that had previous ablation, which is that thin arrow, and then a few years later, surveillance imaging is now showing this exophytic new lesion, which is clearly separate from this, and the uh, options for management are nuanced. There's no clear guidelines on them, and it's dealer's choice of either surveillance until three centimeters, then repeat ablation versus doing a radical uh, or partial uh, nephrectomy, especially considering what the other side is like and those, the genotype of the patient. If they have one of these genotypes which is known to have early onset and recurrent tumors, then we might be more aggressive to just enucleate the tumors, um, which again is something the Linehan group is key on, uh, tumor enucleation versus actual parenchymal excision uh, in order to maximize nephrons. This is that term of the salvage partial nephrectomy, which is uh, uh, when your patients are having a third or fourth ipsilateral renal operation. Once again, technically challenging but feasible. Ultrasound is very important modality in these cases, and they do describe loss of the kidney in, in three of their 13 patients. And this paper came out in 2007, right when I guess robotics was taking off, and they do highlight that robotic surgery will change the nature of the salvage partial nephrectomy. And there's been a few series since then that have commented on the robot doing second and third partials with uh, obviously much more ease than, uh, than uh, uh, simple laparoscopic. The, this is one of the newer papers, sorry I covered the citation there, but it came out just this year, and it's the structured assessment and follow-up for patients with hereditary kidney tumors, once again driven mostly by expert consensus. Um, but the screening for these conditions starts young, especially for VHL and the hereditary leiomyomatosis and RCC, with imaging starting even up uh, uh, at age eight. And for VHL, on the VHL Alliance website, there's some genotypes where they advocate renal ultrasound starting at age two for patients that really are known to be early uh, presenters of the, of the disease. And so this is available for patients, for uh, care providers to get a sense of the guidelines and to tell patients how often they would be imaged. But generally, it's imaging once a year with either ultrasound or CT scan. Again, given the patient's history and the type of tumor, the, the type of uh, 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 genetic mutation that they harbor. So the conclusions then is that RCC is, 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 can be hereditary or sporadic as we know, but TCGA analysis of both familial and sporadic is starting to get the sense that RCC is a uh, disease of altered cell metabolism and epigenetics. There are clear genotype-phenotype interactions which can be discerned with <coughs> referral to genetic counseling um, to let us know what not only the subtype of RCC but maybe how that subtype will behave in terms of age of pre presentation, uh, extra renal manifestations, and uh, uh, severity of disease. And finally, that the, the HRCC clinically can be difficult to manage given the young patient age, the need for repeat renal surgeries, um, and the, uh, the aggressive nature of some types of these RCCs, particularly the type 2 papillary RCC. Thanks very much.